this silence fell upon the congregation. You, you all hear me in the back, okay? God is good all, all, all the time. Okay. Amen. So let's talk about some useless inventions. Uh, there are there are so many out there that this list started out way longer than it ended up, and then one day I was in my office and I realized that I had spent like an hour reading up on these things, and I still had like seven verses to study, so I stopped. Um, have you ever thought, man, instead of instead of going to a sauna, what if I could bring the sauna with me? This bad boy's from Finland. Uh, and it's one of the few things on this list that you can actually still get your hands on, like I know you're dying to. Uh, Amazon.com sells modern versions of this that are just as ridiculous, if not more so. Um, I love that uh, the model's not even in that thing. They just photoshopped her face on top of it. That's a, that's a real listing. You can look this up later. Um, how about a baby basket? Circa 1937, uh, worried that your baby's not getting enough fresh air. You just put them in this wiry basket and precariously hang it over your high-rise apartment window, problem solved, boom. Someone actually thought this was a good idea. That shocks me. Um, all right, you've heard of the tandem bicycle, right? They made a song about the bicycle that's built for two. You've heard of the tandem bicycle. What about the cigarette holder that's built for two? That, that is the most romantic thing I think I've ever seen. 1955 <laughs> on that one. Um, or maybe you don't have a date and the forecast is looking a little gloomy. Well, just for you, uh, there is the cigarette umbrella. <laughs> this was invented just one year earlier in 1954. It's like, it's like the opposite of the Nicorette patch or the, the chewing gum. This is how can I make sure that nothing stops me from smoking an umbrella <laughs> and a cigarette. You gotta stay dry. Uh, so does your hair and makeup when you're in the shower. For all you ladies who think showering after you do your hair and makeup makes more sense, there's the 1970 shower hood. I don't look at this, I gotta figure that there's like the steam building up in this plastic face shield that's pressed against her probably isn't helping her makeup a whole lot, but whatever. Um, this next one I kind of liked at first. Uh, illuminated tires, 1960. You can pick out any color you wanted, uh, someone from Goodyear was pitching this, and they envisioned a day, and you, I found this quote, this was part of their, their big pitch. They envisioned a day where a wife would look at her husband and say, honey, can you go change the tires? I want to wear my blue dress tonight. This one. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't, it's, at first, I don't think it seems entirely useless, at least it's cool looking, but they were crazy expensive, and as it turned out, pretty dangerous, because not only is it really distracting, when everyone's wheels are lighting up different colors, but... <laughs> Uh, also, because of the material that they had to make them out of, it would wear down really quick, uh, and it, as soon as uh, you got just a little bit of wear on the tire, it, it was dangerous, and uh, not to mention if you just got them a little bit dirty, they started looking pretty terrible. So these never actually made it to market. There were a lot of people that wanted them, but they never, they never happened. Last one, we're going to move on to important things. Last one. Are you interested in minimizing your entertainment experience to its absolute limit and all but guaranteeing long-term eye strain? This is inventor Hugo Gernsback uh, demonstrating TV glasses. You can take your television on the go, take that iPhone. And I, what's crazy to me is that it's just, it's all up here in the antennas, but there's also nothing covering his ears. So like whatever is going on on the show that no one else around you can watch, everybody else around you gets to listen to. So lucky them and, and lucky you. Uh, in 1926, when he was pitching this, the first thing he said is, I promise you can't get electrocuted. So that builds confidence. Um, this morning, why are we doing all this? This morning, uh, I want to look at uh, how to avoid being useless for Jesus. Is that a provocative enough title for you? I hope so. That's probably the most provocative title I've ever used in a sermon. How to avoid being useless for Jesus. That word useless is pretty touchy. You don't go around calling people useless without them getting deeply offended. If you say someone's useless and maybe they think, well, I'm not valuable, I'm not worth loving, that can be a hard one. It a lot hurt with that. But there's another way that we can mean useless. A razor without a blade is useless. A guitar without strings is useless. Uh, dead cell phones is pretty useless. I think that's sort of what Jesus had in mind, what Jesus meant when he talked about salt without taste, or he talked about a light being put under a basket, it's, it's not doing anything. Well, the Holy Spirit's given a word to Peter and to us through Peter this morning, in 2 Peter chapter 1, and I want to ask you to stand to receive it. We're going to pick up right where we left off last week, 2 Peter chapter 1, 
beginning with verse 5. This is the Word of God. These are the words of God given to the Apostle Peter by the Holy Spirit. We ought to receive them as such. Now for this reason also, applying all diligence, in your faith supply moral excellence. And in your moral excellence, knowledge. And in your knowledge, self-control. And in your self-control, perseverance. And in your perseverance, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. Say it with me if you believe it. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, something that is never useless. As Paul said to Timothy, it's profitable. For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. God, I pray that you would train us in righteousness this morning, that you would teach us, Holy Spirit, that you'd reprove us where we need it and correct us, that we might live lives that are pleasing in your sight and point others to the cross, Lord, that we sang about this morning. God, make us useful for the kingdom. We, we want to be salt, we want to be light, we want to be laborers in the harvest, called by Jesus into a loving relationship with Jesus, to become like Jesus while we are on mission with Jesus. I'm believing because of his own promise that what we've asked for we'll receive even this morning. We won't leave here like we came, in Jesus' name. Matthew uh, 25, Jesus shares some words with us. They're words that believers want to hear. I hope that they're words we have an expectation of hearing, all of us in this room, that they're words that are ahead of us. Here they are. Well done, good and faithful servants. Last week we looked at Peter's introduction, and if you remember, before even he reminded them of his office as an apostle and the authority with which everything he was writing was coming to them, he told them that he was what? Bondservant, the Lord's servant. He prioritized his identity over his calling, and then he reminded us that we've received the same faith as him. He says, your faith is just like mine. We got the same gospel, we got the same baptism, and I think all of us because of that, have the same capacities in us as Peter did. Meaning, I think all of us have it in us to hear the voice of Jesus and take such a step that we are walking on water to come to him. I think that's in all of us. But at the same time, I think we also have it in us, that same capacity, because we have the same faith, we have the same gospel, and we're made of the same substance as Peter. I think all of us also have that capacity to end up denying Jesus from time to time, if not with our words, then certainly with our actions, I think we have that in us uh, too, like Peter did. So I look at a text like this, and I think about Peter introducing himself as a servant. I think of how I am called to be the Lord's servant. I think about how all of us are called to be servants of the Lord, following him, obeying his word. And, and on that great day when we finally stand before our master by the same grace that, that Jesus extended to Peter and picking him back up, we really want to hear the same thing that Peter wanted to hear. Well done, good and faithful servant. So how do we ensure that we will? Would you know that you can? Peter tells us here that you can because he tells us how to avoid being useless, how to avoid being unfruitful. It's verse 8. We're going to get to that, but we're going to start with verse 5 and sort of work our way through this. 
He says, for this reason. Well, for what reason? We need to retrace our steps a little bit. If you weren't with us last week, this is the, the very brief recap of my message last week. Here's the reason that he's building on. His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Say that again, church. I had to do this last week. How much has he given you? Everything. everything. You have everything you need for life in godliness. Everything. We've got the word and we've got the word made flesh. In, in his gospel, John says that in the beginning was the word. The word was made flesh. That, that no one has seen God but Jesus, who is the word who became flesh, came to explain him to us. He's the word with skin on. Paul says... That uh, the written word is sufficient for every good work, meaning anything that the Lord is calling you to do, you've got a chapter and a verse that's going to help you accomplish it. There's enough there for you. It's sufficient. We've got the word of God, and we've got the word of God embodied in the life of Jesus Christ. And Peter says, you've got everything you need for life and godliness. That's everything you need to know God, everything you need to have a relationship with God, everything you need to live for his glory. You've got it. There's nothing you need to be obedient to him and fulfill the commands that he's given you that you don't already have available to you. For that reason, Peter starts. And there's another reason that he gave to you. Well, look, there's a, there's a second one. Also, he said, he's granted to us his precious and his magnificent promises. And they do two things. They allow us to escape the corruption of the world, one. And they allow us to partake of the divine nature. That's looking at the text from last week. You know how corrupt this world is? You've got some idea. We got a reminder of it this week. 19 grade schoolers, two of their teachers. That incident, that horrifying day, that is the corrupt fruit of a corrupt world. That's what that is. It's reminding us of the substance of fallenness and of brokenness that's around us. The good news is that God is reconciling this world through his son's death, and he's recreating it by his spirit into his kingdom. Revelation says this. Hold on to these words. Behold, I am making all things new. How many things? Oh. All things. I am making all things new. I'm, de I'm defeating death. I'm taking away tears. God himself is going to dry the tears in our eyes on that great day. Jesus said, I am making all things new. Give it time. Peter says, for this reason, all right, for this reason, that we've been given everything we need pertaining to life and godliness, that we've been given the precious promises of God that are going to free us from the corruption of this world and unite us to him. For that reason, he says, applying all diligence or making every effort, your Bible might read, in your faith, your faith is the same kind of faith that he's got. He tells us to supply some things. And I really like, I'm partial to the New American Standard. That's the Bible that I preach out of. But I'm not beyond borrowing from other translations when I think it gets it maybe a little bit even better in the English. I really like how the English Standard reads. It says, supplement your faith. I think that's even a little easier to understand what Peter's saying. Supplement your faith. Anyone here take a multivitamin? I remember when I first got married, I was leaving the house. How many times my mom was saying, you need to take a vitamin? I was, I was like tired. And going, like, are you taking a vitamin? A multivitamin uh, is a supplement, right? I remember when I did live at home, I remember my dad taking fish oil pills. It's a supplement. That's something you take. Other people would probably take fish oil pills. It's a supplement. I remember when Jenny had this app that would tell us how big Reese was when she was pregnant. Like, oh, he's the size of a blueberry today. Or, like, his 11 weeks, he's, he's the size of a lime. And I'm always like, okay, that's pretty cool. And we look at this kind of every day, every week. And then one day it says he's the size of a papaya. And I didn't, I don't know how, I need a reference for that. I'm like, okay, well, that's cool, but how big is this papaya? Uh, that wasn't as helpful. But anyway, when Reese was inside of uh, my wife growing to various sizes of produce, what she was doing <laughs> all along is she was taking a supplement. She was taking a prenatal vitamin, mostly for the folic acid, I think is why they... I don't even know what that exactly does. I just know that now he's as tall as the King Pumpkin over at Marnsville, 99.9 .9 percentile in his height. So yay, folic acid, I guess. That's probably where that's coming from. But actually, one of my regular prayers, uh, one of my regular prayers for Reese is out of Luke 2. Lord, increase him in, uh, in knowledge and in stature and wisdom and in favor with God and with, with men. And I always look at his height as an indicator that that prayer's got God's amen. 
he's getting tall, like stature's there, and hopeful for the rest of it. But, but why, why do you take a supplement? What's the point of a supplement? Well, it, it either adds to what you got, strengthens what you got, or it keeps you from becoming deficient in something, in something that you need to be healthy, in something you need to, to be strong, something you need to keep from getting run down or getting weak or getting sick, right? You're supplementing something in your body, something that you have. In this case, Peter's calling us to supplement our faith so that we won't end up useless or unfruitful. He's saying, supplement your faith. Remember, he's writing to those who have received faith. He's writing to Christians. So he's telling us, strengthen what you've already got. Add to your faith. Supply that faith. Now wait a minute, isn't faith enough? Isn't, isn't faith enough? Aren't we we're saved by faith? Isn't that what Ephesians says? Isn't that what Romans says? Yes, 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 faith is enough. You're saved by faith alone, apart from the works of the law. You were made righteous by faith alone. You have peace with God by faith alone in the finished work of Jesus. But do you want to be useful? That's a whole other question. Do you want to be useful? Do you want to be fruitful? Do you want to honor the one who died that you might live? Because if you don't, I'm going to say this. I don't think you actually have faith. Not the saving kind. The Bible speaks of a dead faith. There's another kind of faith. It's a dead faith that doesn't save. Every professing believer ought to ask themselves from time to time, is the faith that I'm professing, is it the right kind of faith? Does my life show that? Do I have any evidence of it? The word calls us to ask that question. If I really believe that Jesus was crucified for my sins, that my life, now and forever was purchased by his blood, that he saved me when I wasn't even looking for him, when I was his enemy, when I would have gladly been the one to drive the nails into his hands, that he still came and he died for me, if I really believed that, and that he saved me. How could I ever be content for being useless for Jesus, for being useless for the kingdom? When Romans 12 calls us to present ourselves as living sacrifices, it calls that service of worship reasonable. I want you to look at that word. If you don't know a whole lot of Greek, it's not going to matter. I want you to look at that word reasonable. What's that look like in the blue? Logic. Reasonable. Logic. You're logical. This is how my life logically is going to end. If I've been changed by Jesus Christ, if I really believe the gospel, if I'm really saved, if I'm really going to him when I leave this world, then it is logical, it is reasonable that my life is going to look the way this word says that it's going to look. It means it doesn't make any sense not to do what he's calling you to do. To say that you believe that the one who is holy, holy, holy allowed himself to be nailed to a tree so that you can live a life of largely indifference, apart from maybe an hour on Sunday, or a Sunday once in a while. That's the definition of delusion. It doesn't make any sense. If, if Jesus isn't the center of your life, Jed, you said this not long ago. If he isn't your everything, he's nothing to you. I'm going to borrow from the great theologian, Jed Serka. <laughs> if Jesus isn't everything to you, be very concerned. Be very, very concerned. Do, do you really believe this gospel? He's not the center of your life. I, I'm calling you as, as your pastor. Do some soul searching. Do some soul searching. Really ask and wrestle with this question. Why, why is he so low in my priorities? Why is his word the, the last thing I get to if I get to it? Why is prayer something that maybe I do once a week when someone else is praying and I'm praying with them? We're to be offerings to him. And, you know, you think of offerings, you think of sacrifices, you think about it in an Old Testament sense, and here's something they largely had in common, they were dead, right? It doesn't squirm as much when the animal's dead and you put it up on the altar, it's dead, but the thing about living sacrifices is they tend to squirm on the altar. We're called to be living sacrifices, so I think it makes sense somewhat that there's that squirming, there's that kind of wrestling going on. So I think another way to look at this passage back in 2 Peter beyond... How to avoid being useless. Another way you could look at this 
is how do I keep myself on the altar? Living for the singular purpose of honoring the one who loved me and gave himself for me. How do I keep myself on that altar as a practice of my life? You do it by supplementing your faith. And there are some, there's some tells in this text to, to see, find out, am I not doing this? Am I not supplementing my faith? Notice that all these things are tied to the knowledge of Jesus. It's mentioned three different times here. And the word that, that Peter uses, he's talking about an experiential knowledge. This is a knowledge of relationship. I, I know about it because I know it. And he says that in that, grace and peace are multiplied to you. So do you lack peace? Can I suggest this morning that you're not supplementing your faith as you need to? Do you lack an enjoyment of God's grace? Are you supplementing your faith? What else? Everything pertaining to life and godliness comes through this experiential relationship. So are you struggling with life? Are you lacking in joy? Are you lacking in fullness? Maybe you're not supplementing your faith. Are you struggling to be godly? Is your life really more reflective of that corrupt and broken world that's around you than it is of Jesus Christ? You're not supplementing your faith. There's something that's lacking. There's something that's missing. There's something that's off. It's like when you need to take a vitamin, right? Sometimes you know you need to take a vitamin. I can't wake up or I'm always tired or falling down. Maybe I need to take a vitamin. Maybe I can figure that out. Other times, maybe you don't realize you've got some deficiency or something lacking until, say, like a doctor tells you. You go to the office and it's something that he recommends that you do because he sees a little bit more than you see. Let the Word do that. That's what the Word is doing. Let it do it. Let it have its finished and complete work in you. Don't be satisfied with an incomplete Christian life if something is missing. Remember, Peter's writing to believers. Don't lose sight of that. This letter's written to believers. Look at the result, verse 9. If you lack these qualities, if you're not supplementing your faith, Peter describes you as walking around blind, being short-sighted, meaning your spiritual vision is impacted, your eyesight is dim. It's not what it should be. I would bet you, I would bet you that if that describes you, that you're, you're looking around a whole lot more than you're looking up. That you're focused on your needs more than you are the things of the kingdom, which Jesus promised will unlock the supply of your needs. You're so stuck on where you are that you won't step into where God will take you. You're focused on conflict you have with people, and you're missing the spiritual warfare that's involved in that, the deeper things, you can't see it, you're blind to it, and because of that, you're making yourself an easy target for Satan, and you're forgetting even, look what he says, you're forgetting your purification from your former sins, so you're really, you're blind in both directions. You can't see ahead of you, and you can't see behind you. The promises of God, they don't excite you, and the work that God did that once excited you, now it barely motivates you to even fellowship or do anything for him if it in fact does it all. Peter's argument is God's given you everything you need. Peter is saying, look what he did. Now here's what he's calling you to do. Supplement your faith. You need to add to it. Not to save yourself. Jesus did all that. But to save yourself from uselessness. To save yourself from an unfulfilled Christian life. And a lack of confidence that Jesus did. And what he did is something that you actually believe. A good picture of this, I think, would be a marriage. I'm trying to think, well, how, how could I otherwise maybe explain this? I think a good picture would be a marriage. I love Jane. Fell in love with her quick, early, never really had a second thought after we started dating, and I just never had a thought that there was going to be anybody else that I wanted to spend my life with and raise cute kids with. Um, didn't even date like a whole year before we were married. It was all pretty quick, but the love we had, it was powerful. It was a good thing. It was, it was strong, but... <laughs> If our marriage wasn't get, going to get derailed, if our marriage wasn't get, going to get defeated, we needed to add to it. Right? We needed to add patience to it. We needed to add humility to it. We needed to add more trust to it and more forgiveness to it and time to it and communication and selflessness. All of these things we needed to supplement our marriage. Love's the foundation. Right? It's where we began. But if I'm not adding 
those things to my marriage and she's not adding those things to our marriage, then our marriage is going to be a struggle. Our relationship's probably going to get wrecked in a hurry. It might even get to the point where we're now questioning that love that we started off with. Faith is the foundation of the Christian life, but it's not the finish line. The salvation that comes to you is free. It costs Jesus everything. It's free for you. Your salvation's free. The discipleship you are called to as you follow him, that's costly. It's going to demand your time. It's going to demand your resources. It's going to demand more and more from you. But the gain that you'll get will make you think everything you're losing. It's going to make you reframe all of those things. All those things you think you're losing, it's going to transform that into a willful offering, joyful surrender. So he says, apply all diligence or make every effort in your faith and supplement it, add to it, give everything you have to add into it. And he gives us a list. And it's, it's not meant to be exhaustive. It's not meant to be sequential, I don't think, meaning you're supplementing. It doesn't end here. And like, like self-control is lifted at, listed after knowledge. I don't think he's saying you don't have to control yourself until you know everything. That would be bad advice. It'd be a horrible advice. There's actually a lot of overlap here. You think about um, that famous passage in 1 Corinthians 13 when Paul is describing what love is with patience or perseverance that's included in what love is so it's already sort of included in, in one way so I don't think this is sequential but I think it's very helpful and it gives us an idea of what the activity of the Christian life should look like and what we should not be making just some efforts in but every effort he says Peter's calling us to what I would say is a holy discontentment with wherever you are spiritually. You can't float in the Christian life. People, people get this idea that if I'm not, you know, really moving forward in my walk with Jesus, if I'm just, if I'm just kind of floating, that I'm going to stay there, that I'm going to stay where I am, that I'm not going to lose ground. It doesn't work that way. If you try to float in the Christian life, what happens is you drift. You'll drift somewhere else, and it'll be damaging. It'll be damaging to your relationships. It'll be damaging to your witness, to the assurance that you have about your heart, to your reward, your family, your church. Maybe to your soul. There's a warning. There's a warning in this book. In fact, let's look at that real quick. Look at this warning. I'm going I'm to preach this before too long. It's ahead of us, so I'm not going to preach it this morning. I'm going to read it this morning, though. Go forward uh, just one chapter and look at verse 20. 2 Peter 2.20. I don't have this on the screen, so you have to turn there if you want to see it and not just hear it. 2 Peter 2.20. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it. Turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. Presented this morning without a whole lot of comment there. I'm going to preach that. I'll say this. It is possible. It's very possible. To have a profession of faith in your life. And then one day become indifferent. And become unfeeling. And become uncaring. And drift right into destruction. That's what Peter's saying. Don't float. Swim. Swim hard. Here's what that looks like. It gives us seven things. I was coming up with my list of useless inventions. I borrowed the same number. Seven. So I cut it off at seven. Biblical number of completeness. You see it a lot in Revelation. Seven churches, seven stars, seven angels. All that. Seven. Now we can take these seven. We can break them apart. We can look at all the Greek. We can do a word study on all of this. But I, I, I think... What might be more impactful is if I take these seven and turn them into seven questions, I think. Because a sermon without an application, that's like going to the doctor because you don't feel good, and then having the doctor say, we well, don't look good, and then just going home. That doesn't really get you anywhere. So I'm going to turn these seven into seven questions. Hopefully this is helpful. First, are you pushing yourself toward moral excellence? A good barometer of that in your life is, are you living with an attitude of how far can I go before it's sin? Run away from that. Run away from that. 
Make sure you're not mentally categorizing the things that nail Jesus to the cross. Like some things, you know, it's kind of unacceptable. Other things you'll tolerate in small amounts. You're, you're not, you're not called, you are not called to be less sinful than all the people around you. I don't care if it's your neighbors, your, your co-workers, I don't care if it's your other brothers and sisters in the church. You're not called to be just less sinful than them. You're called to be holy as he is holy. And when you compare yourself with them and that's your standard, you've got to go back to Christ. You've got to go back to the cornerstone. He's the one that we build our lives on. He's the one that we pattern our lives on. Realize that if it's your life, and are you are you pushing toward moral excellence? Are you are you gossiping? Are you grumbling about a lot of things? Do you have a wandering eye? Understand that, that Jesus hates that as much as he hates adultery, as much as he hates slander. We are called to make every effort toward moral excellence. Second, are you being diligent to increase your knowledge of God, of his word? of his character, of his will. A heart that has been touched by God wants to know about God. It amazes me, it scares me even. How many people I talk to that, boy, they're just, they want to spend their eternal life in heaven with God, but they don't want to devote even a little bit of their life right now, even a little bit of their week right now, to getting to know anything about the God that they're so sure they're going to go to be with. It just doesn't make any sense to me. And, and this one, I think this is, this is a good one because it's easy to work on. Real easy one to work on. You could join a Bible study. We have several of those going on right now in church. There's always one on Wednesday right now because of the, the ladies group, and, and we've got discipleship even on Thursday with some of the guys. There's like multiple opportunities just to get into a Bible study. Or you, you, could just, you could just show up to church like an hour early and engage in Sunday school when we dig a little deeper into some things. Or you could just, you could just spend more time. Just you in, in your Bible alone, without distractions, you and the Holy Spirit in the Word, just getting away with God. Make His voice the first voice you hear every day. Don't talk to anybody. Don't get into anything until you've been with Him. <coughs> Being diligent, I, I would think. Making every effort, as Peter says, I would think it would look like probably all of that. That's what being diligent would look like. Um, third, are you striving to strengthen your power of self-control. The power that God's given you. Remember verse 3. He's given you everything you need for godliness. That would include self-control. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5. Are you making every effort to grow that fruit? I've preached this before. I keep I'm pounding this from confessing sin. Not just to God. Confessing sin when you fail will go a long way to helping you overcome. James chapter 5 urges us to have a pattern of confession with other believers. I think 1 John chapter 1, if you read it in context, is really saying the same thing. We need other Christians that we can be vulnerable with, where each of us can kind of acknowledge to each other, here's where I struggle, here's the sins that are the most tempting, that are the ones that, that cause me to fall down the most, and then they can pray for you, and you can pray for them, and both of you can enjoy more victory over those things. And I, I've said it this way, but you don't have to be a book that's read by everybody. I don't think the Bible's calling you to put it out there for everybody, but somebody better be reading you. Otherwise, you're really neglecting one of the greatest things that he's given you for life and godliness, which is his body, the church, these brothers and sisters who and if he's made it their calling to walk beside you and to bear these burdens with you. So do that. Take advantage of that. Strive to strengthen your power of self-control. And I would argue you do that through confession. Fourth, are you seeking after the Lord to enlarge your capacity for perseverance? Is your faith consistent when trials come, when troubles come? In fact, is it growing in the midst of those things? This is talking about uh, a patience or an endurance in doing what is right and not growing weary in it. Spiritual staying power that will die before it gives in. William Barclay, in his commentary, he said this. I thought this was pretty good. He says, this is the spirit which bears all things because it knows that these things are leading to a goal of glory. He said, it's not the patience that just kind of grimly waits it out till the end, but one that radiantly hopes for what the end is bringing. Fifth, this one's pretty connected. Are you diligent in godliness? And we'll separate this from moral excellence. That was the first one on the list. Well, how do you separate moral excellence and godliness? Well, there's more to God than his moral excellence, although he's perfect in it. There's more to him than that. This is speaking 
of a practical awareness of God in every detail of your life. A, a thinking and a speaking and a living that reveres God and reflects God. Think about Isaiah chapter 6. we got this scene of heaven. We have these angels that are surrounding God. The prophet calls them the burning ones. They're always in his presence. And so what happens? They're reflecting his glory. They're reflecting him in their lives. Think about Psalm 139 where it says, where can I go from his spirit? Understand that that's not poetry. There's nowhere you can go. There is nowhere you can go where the spirit of God isn't. Strain your eyes to see him everywhere. The more you do that, the better your vision is going to be if you practice that. Sixth, are you making every effort to grow your affection for your brothers and sisters in Christ? The important point an affection that moves you to action. Brotherly kindness, as Peter puts it. I almost phrased that, are you making every effort to grow in your affection for the church? But I think that lets us off the hook. Because I think it's easier to love the church when we think of it as just this kind of massive, invisible body of faceless people, just the kind of church as a whole. It's easy to love that. But when it comes to loving individual Christians, when it comes to, to loving, you know, the people in the pews next to us, we got to deal with their shortcomings like all the time. That makes it harder, harder to practice that. It's a battle. Someone said, uh, to dwell above with the saints we love, oh, that will be glory. But to dwell below with the saints we know, that's another story. And I still, to this day, have not been able to find who said that. He was anonymous. I think he probably wanted to stay anonymous saying that. But, um, Billy Graham said, if you find a perfect church, don't join it, because you'd spoil it. I think that's the same meaning. So what does this part of supplementing look like? Philippians says, with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves, right? Every time. If it's between me and them, they win. Imagine if everybody's doing that. Romans 12 takes it a step further, says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, and then watch this, I love this part, this is my favorite part, outdo one another in showing honor. Like, make it a contest to outdo each other in showing honor, and loving each other, and serving each other. What does that mean? That means encourage them even when they discourage you. Show up for them. Even when they don't show up for you, pray for them. And don't tell them I'm praying for you. It's funny how we can weaponize that I'm praying for you. That's dirty. <laughs> Pray for them and keep it a secret. Don't tell them. Go as far as you can out of your way to build them up, especially when that's the last thing you feel like doing because Peter says, take efforts toward brotherly kindness. Last one. Are you making every effort to stir up love? Are you making every effort to stir up love? Brotherly kindness limited this to kind of within the body, right? Within the church. I would hope that most of our relationships there come with kind of a natural affection. We should find that, I think, easier most of the time, be able to relate to most if we're always struggling with people in the church. It's maybe a call for some major self-reflection. Maybe it's one of those, maybe it's me and not them conversations. This is speaking to something so much bigger. Lost people. Indifferent people. People you don't like. People that don't like you. Are you exerting yourself for them? To love them. To do good to them. Jesus commanded that. Do good to them. I said this a few weeks back, but I think the verse here makes it worth repeating. I think, here's a danger. I think we can feel like we're standing in a place of obedience when we simply see all of that and just refuse to retaliate. But there's a positive command in Scripture to overcome <coughs> evil with good. That's intentional. That can only be done through acts of grace that are done for the ungracious. That can only be done through acts of kindness that are done for the kinds that don't deserve it. And that means every time going out of your way to do it. How far? How far? And I always say this. However far the cross was from the glory of heaven, go that far. And not one step further. And when you realize how far Jesus came to love you, do you good. And how undeserving you were. You won't even try to count those steps. That's our self. That's our supplements. Peter is saying, give every effort to. He says, if these things are yours, 
If these qualities are yours and they are increasing in your life, you're not going to be useless. You're not going to be unfruitful. And you're going to be confident that you really do belong to Jesus. Why? Because those things reflect Jesus. And those who are called by Jesus are called to become like Jesus. Let's pray. Father, again, we, we turn our hearts to you in thankfulness. Lord, not only that you've saved us, past tense done, one sacrifice for all time, but God, that even right now you're transforming us. Help us to be doers of the word that we've just read and heard. Help us to supplement our faith with everything that pleases you, Lord. All of these things and then some, that, that we wouldn't be useless, that we wouldn't be fruitless, unfruitful in our living, that we wouldn't be, Lord, hopeless in the assurance you want us to, to walk in in Jesus. So I pray that these qualities would be ever-increasing in us. Not that they might take us to heaven, that work's already been done on our behalf in Christ, but that they might bring you greater glory and make us more like him. In Jesus' name.